Thanks everybody for joining us on this town hall tonight. My name is Winston Bromley. I'm the marketing director here at Warriors Heart. Warriors Heart is the number one healing center in the world for warriors, for veterans, active duty, and first responders for the treatment of addiction or chemical dependencies with a co-occurring condition. Before we start, I just wanted to mention at Warriors Heart, we're always growing and we're doing some really great growth inside of Bandera, as well as our Milford, Virginia location. And we're looking for some good people to grow with us. So what we're looking for specifically are some cooks, some client relations, and people who are grave, who would want to become graveyard shift inside client relations. If that interests you or you know people that have those capabilities, please reach out to hr at warriorsheart.com. So enough of my PSA. Here we go. <laughs> so I'm really excited because I've interviewed Robert before in the past when he was an alumni. And it was a really great call that we did about a year and a half ago. But tonight, I get to have him on here as one of our admissions advocates. He's former law enforcement. He's an alumni of our program. And tonight, we're going to be talking about his role, his background of service, his journey to recovery, and how the programs that we have can help the warrior class become sober, confident warriors. So without further ado, Robert, welcome back to the, to the town hall. Appreciate you being here. Thank you, Winston. Great to be here. Thank you. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself and where you grew up. Let's start there. I grew up in a little town in Louisiana called DeVille. It's uh, right in the middle of the state uh, in the Alexandria Pineville area, a little east of uh, Pineville, a little town called DeVille. It's where I grew up. I uh, went to college there in Alexandria, LSU, uh, extended campus, Alexandria, Um Youngest of three boys, always wanted to be a cop uh, and set my sights on that, set my college career on that mm -hmm. um, and pursued that. Went to uh, Shreveport, Louisiana uh, to fulfill that that passion. Um, nowadays, I've uh, been separated from law enforcement for about five years now. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, divorced uh, for a few years now, but a uh, proud father of three kids. My son, Henry, is 20. My daughters, Jillian uh, and Gabriella. Jill is 18 and Gabby is 15. Okay. So tell us a little bit about your background as a police officer, corrections deputy, and a few other things that you actually did inside the law enforcement world. Hired on in law enforcement uh, July of 2001. Um, hired on with Caddo Parish Sheriff's Office there in Shreveport, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And with that background, uh, initially I worked in the jail as a jailer, working security with the inmates. Um, from there, uh, got an administrative job, compliance coordinator, did that job for a little bit until I transferred over to uh, uh, White Collar Crime Task Force with the city of Shreveport, was financial crimes detective. At the same time, I was also a hostage negotiator, uh, trained for that and was uh, in that role as kind of a part-time position. Uh, mm -hmm. From there, uh, I was assigned to the Northwest Louisiana Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, which if you've seen Dateline, you know what mm -hmm. I'm talking about. Um, eventually, I was transferred over to the Youth Services Division to start working crimes against children full time. Mm -hmm. uh, did that for a number of years, along with uh, an assignment to the FBI Cybercrime Task Force. So I was uh, a task force agent with the FBI as well. From there, I was also a youth and adolescent forensic interviewer, had a ample training with that. Uh, when that ended or when I ended that, uh, I kind of got burned out in that role, went to patrol uh, and was a patrol deputy. I uh, did a number of things there, including uh, DRE, drug recognition expert, and that's in the area of field sobriety. I think roughly maybe 1,200 law enforcement officers uh, in the nation are certified as a drug recognition expert. It's uh, really, really difficult training. Mm -hmm. uh, so pretty diverse background in law enforcement. It accomplished quite a bit in 16 and a half years. Sounds like it. Sounds like it. So where did the path <clears throat> break off for you and lead you down a road of, of addiction? It all started around 2006. Uh, mm -hmm. I was able to really isolate on that with uh, one of the assignments there at Warrior's Heart when I was inpatient called the Lifeline. Mm -hmm. uh, and the lifeline is a, a pretty simple explanation. It's the line of your life. You know, the, uh, they give you this long butcher sheet of paper. Uh, and on one side, your positive core values, positive people in your life. And the other, of course, is a negative. And you just go through and list the major events that happen in your life. 
-hmm. And from there, I was able to see that things started to shift around 2006. And uh, by 2015, there was hardly anything positive. But from the law enforcement standpoint, 2006 is when things began to change. Mm -hmm. That was when I was assigned to the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force and really, really was exposed to some of the most horrendous things I'd ever seen in my life uh, and some really tough cases, tough assignments. In my personal life, I was also dealing with some very, uh, very hard things to deal with. Uh, that year we were adding on to our house and I had an accident during that time uh, where I broke my back, which was the second time I fell off the roof and broke my back for the second time. First time was an O1 in a car wreck. Uh -huh. Also had fractured my wrist and cut my head open. Uh, I was actually in the process of being evaluated for what later turned out to be Crohn's disease. While I was in the hospital with those injuries, my colon ruptured and, uh, I almost died from that. Uh, they ended up having to do emergency surgery, take out the majority of my colon and put me on a colostomy bag. Uh, that experience was very traumatic. I was uh, in the hospital for 19 days, mm -hmm. lost about 45 pounds in that 19 days. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can remember very vividly praying for death. You know, it mm -hmm. was, it was a tough thing to overcome. Um, and then subsequently had a surgery about seven months later to remove the colostomy and connect my small intestines to what was left in my colon. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of uncertainty in life during that time. Uh, up until that point, I'd only ever really been shown up drunk one time in my life. You know, I was a teetotaler most of the most of my life. And from there, uh, going back through my story and looking at my lifeline, that's when everything started to shift. Um I was sitting at a Mexican restaurant with the wife. She was trying to help me remember some of the things that happened while I was in the hospital because there was just a lot of blank spaces. A lot of days I just could not remember. And I ordered a margarita because it tasted good. And somehow within the next five years, that one margarita turned into going through three liters of tequila in a week with my margaritas. You know, I like to drink them on the rocks. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the uh, pain pills. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, having broken my back at that point twice, I've actually done it three times now, but having broken my back twice, the uh, wrist, the surgeries that I had, there was ample amounts of pain pills readily available. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was an incident that happened at work of a personal nature that I won't recount here, but it's mm -hmm. part of my story um, that it upset me on my way home. Uh, I reached into my center console and pulled out some of those Percocets and took them, not because I was physically in pain, but because I was an emotional wreck. I was emotionally pain in emotional pain. I just wanted to numb out from that. Mm -hmm. So around 2006, 2007 is when uh, the addiction really started to set in. Of course, it was a, a little bit of a slow build in some ways. Mm -hmm. uh, but over the next several years, it just it got out of hand. It really did. So. <clears throat> what was your turning point? Like, what was the breaking point that that made you seek help? I know we'll talk about Warriors Heart in a second, but what was that breaking point for you? There was a lot of stubbornness on my part. I, I knew I needed some help, and I was actually trying to get help. I'd been in, I've been in counseling for over ten years, and I was trying to deal with some of those issues, but I wasn't going all in. I wasn't telling my agency, everything they needed to know. I wasn't telling the employee assistance program, everything that was really going on in life. Mm -hmm. um, I was, I was suffering in silence. I was trying to handle things on my own and it cost me my career. Eventually mm -hmm. in 2018, I was terminated from employment mm -hmm. and I still didn't quite give up. Uh, we lost the house. We lost most of our possessions, I ended up uh, living with the wife's parents uh, and other things happen in life that that should have made most people just, you know, bow out and go and seek help. But mm -hmm. I didn't. Uh, I dabbled in AA in 2019 due to an issue with one of my children that was very traumatic. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, I didn't commit until uh, July 4th. Well, excuse me, July of 2020 mm -hmm. is when things really came to a head. On July 4th, the wife had had enough and she had asked me to leave. And even then, I, I can fix this on my own. I got this, right? That was the mentality. I can handle anything. Yeah. Um, I was looking for a retreat to go to because I was looking for a quick fix and to get back in the relationship with the wife, to get back to life. But I was suffering just in just too heavily. On 
August the 1st of 20, that was kind of the red letter, de- red letter date in my history. Mm-hmm. Um, I had made a long Facebook post the night before, was very intoxicated. Uh, it scared a, a lot of people. It wasn't suicidal. It was just nuts a little bit, mm-hmm. you know, a little bit crazy. And the following morning on August 1st, the wife had sent me an email cutting contact with me and filing for separation. And that was probably the worst day of my life. And that was my turning point. That night, I started calling treatment centers. That night was the night I picked up the phone and started asking for help. Right. Now, you touched on a couple of points, and I just want to go back a second. Do you find there's still a stigma that exists for, especially in law enforcement? Absolutely. You know, I've con- I've communicated with a lot of a lot of cops over the years mm-hmm. uh, before I came to Warriors Heart, after, et cetera. And yeah, the, the stigma is still there, especially, you know, dealing with uh, folks in my own agency, you know, that I mm-hmm. used to work for uh, and just law enforcement in general. There are some agencies that are very proactive about it, but not all of them are yeah. uh, for the officer themselves. You know, we hold on to that angst because we feel that it's some sort of a competitive edge. Uh, but it's really not. It's eating us up inside, you know? Mm -hmm. So the stigma to ask for help is most certainly there because first and foremost, that's our identity. And we feel that if we raise our hand and say, look, y'all, I need some help, then that job goes away, you Mm -hmm. know? Uh, But I can tell you, if you don't ask for help, the job will surely go away. There's been many people that have asked for help, come to help, uh, come to treatment, gotten the help and gone back to duty. Uh, My sponsee is one of those people right now. Right. Um, but the, the stigma is something that needs to be faced. It's scary, but it, it can be managed. Okay. Yeah. We've obviously, we've had more discussions on this as well, just how, um, different organizations are now approaching the subject. So it's, you know, I'm hoping we all hope that it will get resolved into a, not being a stigma as much anymore. Um, cause it's necessary. Um, now, one of the things is obviously you've gone through our program as you know, you've gone through and you've become an, uh, officially an alumni. And it was really great when we did one of our last um, Facebook lives about a year or two ago that now that I remember, but what's it like to be an admissions advocate now? Like you, you, you come full circle, right? So you're the one who called in. I don't know who you talked to, you probably remember who it was. And then now you're in the role to help others were just like you were back then what does that feel like it's it's mind-blowing in so many different ways you know because ever since I lost my career even before I came to treatment all I wanted to do was help guys that were in the same shape as me in the same Mm -hmm. boat as me I I wanted to be a service to others and to to really help them out and now that it's happened it's just wow I can't believe that it's actually happened and for it to come full circle the way that it has um I look back on that first phone call with Warrior's Heart. Um, Mm -hmm. Long story short, it was August 2nd of 20. I I was directed to call uh, Warrior's Heart. And somebody said, hey, call this guy. His name is Mike. Uh, He's going to be expecting your call. And I called Mike about 10 o'clock that morning. He answered the phone. Hi, Robert. I've been waiting on your call. I broke down, started crying, and just kind of, you know, spilled Mm -hmm. my guts to Mike. And, uh, he was able to get me into treatment and or into training and, you know, get my life started back in the right direction. And then earlier this year, uh, spoke to Mike. He was the one that conducted the uh, phone interview and then started the process for me to come work there. And now he is my supervisor. So it came full circle for both of us. And now I'm actually in the position to be able to help others. And now when I answer the phone, I talk to other people wanting to get into the program I'm like, yeah, dude, I know exactly what you're going through. I've been there. In fact, I've been here in this treatment program and can tell you everything about it that you need to know. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's truly wonderful for me as an employee, but just as an individual, as a person, to be able to pay it back to others. It's, yeah. it's what I've been wanting. And another great thing about the advocates, on, like with you included and with Mike O'Dell, is that you all have been there you've you know either you've served you've been part of law enforcement you've done some sort of service somewhere um so it's really neat to see um, how we can give back and help and help out um or or obviously or if um if you haven't served which sometimes happens you know it's one of your loved ones in your family right and so it's just time that um the ability to understand what they're what the people on the other line are going through 
And so, uh, yeah, so thank you very much for what you do for that. And um, it's such a great story. That's why I really wanted you on here is just to talk about that. But I had a couple other questions like, you know, when you went through the program, so you, you obviously you came in on day one and then you get to day 42 or however long your program was. I don't know how long, but generally ours run up to 42 and then there's extensions out after that. What were the three things that really stood out for you during the program itself? Um. You know, it, I thought about that and it was, it was kind of hard to really focus in on, but the three things that I did focus in on, yeah. um, the only way to, to really heal from all this is to get comfortable being uncomfortable. You know, they say that change never happens from a place of comfort mm -hmm. and with substances, I was numbing with life. I was comfortable. I was codependent in the relationship with the wife. I was in a comfortable spot. Right. Uh, and that was one of the things that stuck out to me. Yeah. It's, Nobody wants to go to rehab. Nobody wants to turn their life upside down. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is the only way that you're going to change. That is the only way that you're going to make it. You right. know, liking it back to, uh, for those of us who have served, liking it back to your academy days or to your basic training days. Mm -hmm. uh, it was something that you really wanted on the other side of that training. Uh, mm -hmm. And you had to get a little uncomfortable to get it. Same thing here. Uh, just had to be uncomfortable, uh, had to be comfortable with that uncomfortability. Uh, something else that, you know, stuck out with me was just open it up to others. You know, it's, it's hard for a lot of us to open up. Many of us don't want to, unless it's somebody else that has been there, done that. We all say the same thing. You haven't experienced this. You don't understand what we're going through. Right. But I'm yeah. surrounded. I'm now surrounded by people in, when I was in treatment uh, that have been through that exactly. And I was denying PTSD, you know, that was for combat vets. That wasn't for guys like me. You know, I had some bad days, but I wasn't, I, I wasn't worthy of saying that I had PTS. Right. So by opening up to these other guys, it validated some of that pain because the feedback I got from them really helped me to understand that I had the right to, to say that. So that was something else that really jumped out at me. Uh, and there again, I was one of those people. And this is the third thing that uh, I was one of those people that, uh, my problem is PTS. It's not substances. Now, I was mm -hmm. a heavy alcoholic, pill addict. Uh, those were my issues. Uh, I went there to treat the PTS. And I've related this to numerous people on the phone. You mm -hmm. will never get to the PTS unless you get your substances out of your system first. You have to quit numbing. I hated it when they said you have to feel it to heal it, but it is absolutely true. Mm -hmm. You have to feel it to heal it. And if you're numbing, if you're on the substances, uh, you're numbing out, you're not facing those emotions, you're just delaying that pain, and it's always going to be there. Mm -hmm. Get the substances out of your system, quit numbing, and face those issues. That is the only way through it. And when you went to Warriors Heart, obviously, you know, you picked, you you went to it because it was referred to you to go, where you found out more about it. But did, did you find when you came to it that it, and this is one of the things that pops up a lot, is that how we don't look like a hospital in any capacity <laughs> we look you know it's a resort it's a resort it's a retreat right like is, is the feelings yeah. of it how did that change your your concept when you came through the gates like when you pulled I, up on it initially they told me welcome home mm -hmm. and i that upset me initially i'll be quite honest because I had been booted out of home. I had no home. At that time, I was sleeping on a mattress on the floor of a buddy's house. He had just moved into a new place. And so it was, he wasn't, nobody else is in the house. I, I didn't feel like I had a home, you know? Mm -hmm. So initially it was off putting. And then when I really, you know, got settled in and I heard other stories of other treatment centers that other guys had been to, man, I was just eternally grateful for where I was. And mm -hmm. having visited other treatment centers and heard the stories of other people in those treatment centers, yes, the place is set up like home. And they really do mean it when they say welcome home. And it does feel like home. Every time I would come back uh, before I became an employee, I would start to get excited every time I got close to Bandera. And then when I got on the grounds itself, it was just like I was just in a spiritual place, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and, and of course, the setup, yes, it used to be a corporate retreat for a big oil company. So it's a nice place. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I do tours at the facility for other people, they they kind of comment on that. 
Yeah. And uh, it just, it really does have very much a home feeling from the employees, from the executive directors, the owners, uh, everybody on down to the other clients that are there. It does have a very, very much have a home feel to it. And there's a dignity about what we do there as well, right? Like at our different, at our two different facilities. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank absolutely. you for that. <clears throat> we're also taking, uh, just so that everybody who's watching right now, we're also taking questions. I forgot to bring that up at the beginning. My apologies. So if you have any questions, go ahead and put them down in the comments. We'll do the best that we can to to answer them while we're on this. Otherwise, we'll answer them afterwards. But we did have one question come through. And as a police officer, if you need help, how can I get help but stay anonymous and keep my job? Here's the stigma side. Go ahead. That can be a tricky part that would uh, mm -hmm. depend on the individual agency. But I can tell you this, most agencies have an employee assistance program. And most agencies, your job is protected if you go to the employee assistance, if you go to your supervisors and raise your hand and say, look, I'm having some problems. I'm having some issues with uh, these substances, with alcohol use, with anger, with PTS, et cetera, and I need some help. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't do that because I did not trust the process. And what else did they have to go on? You know, they, they ended up uh, having to terminate me from employment. Uh, now, of course, the thing that you got to realize with law enforcement agencies, uh, when you do go and ask for help and say, I have this problem, will there be reper repercussions on the job? Yeah, you may have to get transferred into another division for a short time. You may have to, uh, you know, you may have to surrender your weapon uh, and be in a non-enforcement role, an administrative role for a while. But trust me, that's a hell of a lot better than losing your job, losing your benefits, losing everything that you would work for. So my right. best advice, of course, is to go to your agency and tell them, look, this is the issue that I have and I am seeking assistance. And most agencies mm -hmm. will support you and back you up in that. If you that's don't and you continue down that path, you end up getting in trouble. And next thing you know, they send you for a fitness for duty evaluation and you, and you get terminated. Uh, now, uh, if, if you need more information on that, if you need to talk about those kind of things, yeah, call us in the admissions department and we can talk directly with that about what to expect with us. And then you can navigate that with your particular agency. Mm -hmm. And we'll put the, uh, the phone number down below and we'll talk about it in a bit, but, um, yeah, if you want to reach out, I'll give you the number now, but we will be posting it down below. It's 1-866-423-0801. Again, 1-866-423-0801. And thank, thanks for answering that. We did get actually, <clears throat> which doesn't usually happen, so it's a, it's a good sign. We got a comment for you saying, you're an inspiration to me, Robert. Love you, bro. Don't know who it is, <laughs> but that's at the team center. So um, another that. question that came through is, what self-care practices or routines have you found most helpful in maintaining a healthy and balanced lifestyle post-treatment? Oh, there's been quite a bit. Uh, first and foremost, telephone therapy, right? Uh, when I'm having a bad day, reach out to somebody else that I went through treatment with. There's There was a lot of guys, and there's still a lot of guys that I reach out to on a regular basis. Pick up the phone and tell them, man, look, I'm having a bad day. Now, sometimes they'll hit you back. Yeah, yeah, let me tell you about my day, okay? And then you're listening to them. Next thing you know, you're outside of your issues. You're outside of your problem, and you're helping your buddy make it through their day. Mm -hmm. vice versa that's one of the things transcendental meditation is something that helps quite a bit you know the ah of ah with the finger tapping uh the things that most of us would not have done before treatment right mm -hmm. uh yoga has been one of them uh getting out into the outdoors with hiking with kayaking uh, hitting the gym quite often of course therapy with a counselor is something that helps tremendously mm -hmm. journaling um there's just a, a whole number of things that I do and try to do on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And above all else, spirituality, you know, the connection with God, connecting with my higher power, um, the, uh, the church aspect of it, being connected with small groups, the Bible study uh, has been tremendous, uh, tremendous help in that. And I was at war with God before I came to, to treatment and getting back to that has helped quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, AA, you know, uh, being a sponsor for others in the program and still contacting my sponsor on a regular basis, supposed to meet with him this afternoon to talk about a few things um, and other programs. You know, that's the thing about it. Don't ever stop the healing. I mentioned I was going to try to go to a retreat, you know, a short term retreat before I came to treatment. Um, when I 
left Warrior's Heart uh, inpatient program, I went straight into sober living intensive outpatient. That was another aspect of it. I was mm -hmm. here seven and a half months total. But during that time, I took a pass and went up to uh, Hillsboro, Ohio to attend Save a Warrior, which was a four day program that was just phenomenal. Taught me a lot of uh, other good things, such as, you know, transcendental meditation. They reaffirmed that. Mm -hmm. I'm scheduled to go to Warrior Path uh, within the next few months. So don't ever stop on the healing, you know, um, it's, it's called training for a reason, you know, you're training for the mission of your life. And that's one of the programs or one of the assignments that we have is my mission, my life, uh, just as much as you would train for SWAT train on the range to continue to shoot and be proficient in that aspect. When you leave treatment, don't stop doing that because you're going to need that throughout the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. uh, so I continue to do those healthy practices as often as I can. Great. Um, thank you for that. And uh, the comment was actually from Todd S. He's the one that left in a comment, just so that you can talk to him afterwards. Awesome. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> so just a couple more questions that I have for you while we're here is now, well, actually, I'll jump ahead on this one. So one of your passions right now is your podcast, right? Right. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because it, it deals with your healing and recovery, right? Oh, I'd love to. The trick will be getting me to shut up about the podcast, right? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll shut you up when I think you're done. You got <laughs> no, it. Just no, no, go ahead. Please tell us a little bit about it before we move on to the other questions. I'll give you a short tidbit on how it started. Uh, a couple sure. of years ago, I'm trying to figure out my life. And my older brother, Eric, was uh, sitting in my food truck with me. I was running a food truck at the time. Mm -hmm. He's like, why don't you start a podcast? I gave him every excuse. I don't know anything about it. I don't have the money to do that. I don't know how to do that. Uh, excuse, excuse, excuse. A few months later, my my good friend and brother, Kyle Miller, uh, went through treatment with him, uh, called me up and said, hey, man, we're doing a podcast. Come tell your story. I'm like, uh, okay. So I went, and it was like November of 21, and shared my story on the podcast. And it morphed from there. One of the other guys that was doing it wasn't able to continue so he asked me to fill in as one of the co-hosts of the podcast. And we've been rocking and rolling with it ever since. It's called the High Speed Chicken Feed Podcast. Okay, yeah. so I'll say it again. High Speed Chicken Feed Podcast. Exactly. Right. Awesome. Stacking them like driftwood. Yeah, exactly. So uh, where did that name come from? Kyle actually came up with that name. And to be honest, uh, high speed chicken feed is a derogatory term for methamphetamine use, mm -hmm. which is, you know, kind of in Kyle's background. Um but, uh, you know, they came up with the name. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Let's go with it. Exactly. Uh, and we're on most major platforms. We're not on iTunes or iHeart, but we're on Spotify, Audible, Google. We're on quite a few platforms. And we've interviewed some amazing people and done some really good work. Mm -hmm. And here's the, here's the great part about it. It's like a 12th step call in AA, right? Sharing the message with others. We're not making any money on it, but we're having a good time with it. And we're really reaching some people. We've gotten some amazing feedback from people. And one of the best that we had gotten we interviewed a marine named keon mm -hmm. and uh you know he shared a story it was a passionate story it's a great story one of his buddies up in ohio was listening to it and he heard us talking about warrior's heart he, he said he was mowing his grass he heard us talking about warrior's heart he stopped mowing looked us up on the phone and it's like you know what i need some help too he was suffering from some substances and he called up mm -hmm. and i happened to answer the phone that day and I'm sharing a little bit of my background with him. I'm telling him my story about how I came to treatment there at Warrior's Heart. And as we're talking, he stops me and he goes, man, did you say your name is Robert? Do you do a podcast? Is it called the High Speed Chicken Feed? Did you interview a dude named Keon? I'm like, yeah, man, that's me. And it just, it went from there. And next thing you know, he's impatient and we're sitting there having supper and he's sharing a little bit of his story with me. And he just thanked us, thanked me, thanked us. Uh, at Warrior's Heart, thank me and Kyle for what we were doing, because it, without that, he didn't know where he would be. He he would have maybe lost his life, definitely would have lost his marriage. So mm -hmm. it, it's it's a passion project that we're we're doing some really good work with. And in short, the, the best way to describe it is we talk about our life of service, how that service broke us and how we're coming back from that brokenness, trying to give inspiration to others. OK. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. <clears throat> and go ahead and look it up. Uh, it's it's actually a really great podcast. Now, this question just came through. What do you do when you feel like there is no hope? There's always hope, you know, and look, still, even in sobriety, I get that way every now and then. Right. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I, I focus back on what I've learned. I take it one day at a time. Mm-hmm. You know, tomorrow's going to be a better day. Uh, and when I'm feeling like that, I always reach out to somebody and I do my best to reach out to somebody, whether it's uh, my therapist or a buddy in the program or somebody that I work with or a trusted friend, you know, whatever. Uh, there's always hope. There's always a brighter day. I have faced some very dark days that I did not want mm-hmm. to continue. And I'm so glad that I did, you know, the ups and downs in life will happen. Uh, but when those days hit, just keep pushing forward, keep fighting. Okay. Thank you. And then <clears throat> having the ability to look back on where you were and where you are now, right? Cause there's the gap there of when you started, when you first came into to the property, going through the alumni and now becoming an admissions advocate, having the ability to be, be able to look back on where you have been and where you are now, what kind of feelings come up for you? It There's times when I, I really do sit and ponder that and it brings a tear to my eye. It, it Just the journey thus far. And I'm glad that in, in a lot of ways that it wasn't a quick fix. It was an actual long journey because I've learned so much in that time. I'll be quite honest. When I checked in August 18th of 20, I was not somebody that you wanted to be around. I was angry. I was bitter. I had pushed most people out of my life things were going wrong in ways that I could not imagine. And I was tired. I was ready to give up. Um, Nobody wanted to be around me. I was more than a basket case. And it took a little bit of time to come out of that. It took fighting hard to come out of that. But I look back on it and compare where I am now to where I was then. And it's just mind blowing. The things that I have learned in that time, I learned how to stand up for myself again, how to fight for myself again, how to believe in myself again and have passion for other people. And other people have commented on it. Other people that knew me then that were either employees there at Warrior's Heart, or maybe I went through treatment with Warrior's Heart, have commented on it recently. One of the nurses there, Jennifer, and she and I were talking about it the other day, and just the transformation that she's seen in me. I love getting that feedback uh, because it really validates the struggle. And the things that I've accomplished since then, the relationships that I've been able to restore with friends, with family, with my children, Mm -hmm. uh, wasn't able to restore the relationship with the wife, but I am on good terms with her. We communicate often, uh, even though we're uh, divorced and she's remarried, Uh, the, the relationship with the kids and the other things that I have come across, such as the podcast, um, being an ambassador for, uh, the save a warrior program, uh, recently was named to the board of advisors for the Miami recovery project, uh, Brian Sims and the guys down there doing fantastic things uh, for veterans in that area. I'm honored to be mm-hmm. a part of that. Um, uh, I was uh, blessed to be a part of a company called resilient minds on the front lines. Uh, they teach a course in resiliency and I had signed up with them to, uh, be a facilitator. None of these things would have happened had I not gone to treatment, had I not taken the step. And on days when I'm feeling down or when I think I'm still spinning my wheels, I look back on all that and it it, it kind of validates that I have done some really good things in recovery and that I am moving forward in a positive direction. Awesome. Amazing. And you had a friend, <clears throat> Tara, um, who commented, she says, I'm so proud of you, my friend. Keep sharing this, keep sharing your story and inspiring others. Much love. So that was just one I came through. So there you go. I appreciate it. So- yeah, definitely. So we're, we'll end it off with this last question, which is how I like to end off these town halls, is if someone right now is watching and is sitting there broke, broken, not wanting to ask for help, or worse, that they feel that there's past that point, or maybe their spouse or friends are watching and they're really wanting to help, what would you say to them? If you are that person and you feel like you're way past it, you, nobody has ever passed help. If you're still drawing breath, then you have the possibility to recover. Uh, if you still draw in breath, then you have fight left in you and you can push forward and you can make it through. All you have to do is pick up the phone. It's going to be uncomfortable. Things are going to come against you that are going to make you feel like uh, you can't do it. You know, And if you're in a spiritual battle, if you have any kind of faith at all, Kind of expect that and be grateful for that, because if you are having those attacks, then you know you're heading in the right direction, right? So mm-hmm. if if you have breath left, pick up the phone and call and start that fight. The dark days are going to pale in comparison to how bright it can be on the other side of that void. 
That's the thing to remember that if you put everything you have into it and do it for yourself, first and foremost, the outlook on the other side of that pain is just going to be tremendously beautiful, something more than you can possibly imagine. So yeah, definitely, definitely face those fears. If it's going to be scary, life may get turned upside down, but you will be sitting on the other side of it. Like I am just grateful that you took the opportunity. Where else are you going to go? You know, I knew where I was heading, which is why I picked up the phone. Same thing. If you're dealing with somebody with, you know, that, uh, that needs the same type of help a spouse or family member, don't give up on them. I take calls all the time from wives or husbands for that matter, or kids, you know, calling about their loved one, wanting to get them treatment. You know, they have to warn it themselves, but it's nice that they are, that they have somebody there fighting for them. Mm -hmm. uh, I hate to put it in, in this context, but when my wife was done with me, she was done with me. I didn't have anybody fighting on my behalf. I had to do it on my own. And it's refreshing to hear that other people do have that. So hopefully they can see the value in that and honor that and try to change their life, try to change their life for the better. And Thank you. I, I'm sorry. I just wanted to add that. Oh, uh, please. Yeah, please. Uh, <laughs> nobody is beyond saving. I have absolutely seen miracles happen in treatment, uh, specifically there at Warrior's Heart. I have seen just absolute miracles uh, people come in practically blind. They can't see anything other than their own pain, right? And they work through those issues and they have just a whole new eyesight, you know, the, the figurative part of it rather than the little part of it. The figurative people have come in crippled and left on their own two feet. One of the guys I went through treatment with, he came in looking like an 80-year-old man in a wheelchair and turned himself around to the point where he looked I promise you 20 years younger and was healthy and fit and walking on his own two feet when he left. Uh, so it's like seeing the lame walk again, the blind see again and the spiritually dead or just the dead inside come back to life. You know, that's just truly an amazing thing to see that and to be a, a, around that and to witness that, you know, the people that work there know exactly what I'm talking about. I've seen it since I've been there as an employee, but I saw it there as a client myself. So yes, it can happen. Miracles really do happen in that place. Thank you. Yeah, we'll, we'll end it on that. But thank you very much, Robert. Like you're an inspiration. You, you've done so much. We're very proud of, you know, your your journey and how your journey is helping so many others become sober, confident warriors. So thank you for that. Um, to end off this call again, my name is Winston Bromley. I'm the marketing director here. And Warrior's Heart is the number one warrior healing center in the world for veterans, active duty, and first responders for the treatment of chemical or addiction dependency with a co-occurring condition. If you know someone who has an addiction or chemical dependency and has a co-occurring condition who would like to have help, so um, definitely with inside the warrior class or veterans, active duties, first responders, or part of the warrior class, please reach out to us. You can reach out to us at warriorsheart.com or one of the numbers that we have to get right to our admissions advocates. That's 24-7 is 1-866-423-0801. Again, 1-866-423-0801. You call that in, you will be talking to someone live, one of our admissions advocates on site 24-7. Um, so give us a call and get the help that you need. It's time to call. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you very much again, Robert. Really appreciate you being on here. Thanks. Have a great night, everybody. Bye now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.